Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first Sonic Academy live broadcast. Um, this evening in the studio, we're joined with uh, Chris Agnelli and Brian Spence. Hello, everyone. Um, and the plan is we're just going to sort of uh, uh, go through a few tech tips, answer a few questions on the forums, and hopefully get a bit, bit of feedback from you guys. Um, obviously, this is our first uh, live broadcast, so there may be the odd technical hitch here and there. Um, uh, this is really just sort of a test run to um, check all the technologies working and to get your feedback on uh, what you think of the live broadcast and uh, all the stuff that we're doing. So, so I think, Phil, I'm going to try and chair this this session. Uh, so please, guys, get involved in Twitter, on our Facebook, uh, in the forums. Post us questions. This is really about you and what you can give us uh, we've got Phil and Brian here who are going to go through some sounds that you want to know. How to, if you're struggling in the studio with a vocal or you, you want to know how to make a bass sound or find out about Anna or any plugins, pick these guys' brains. They're here for two hours, hopefully, uh, to answer your questions as quickly as we can. So, again, this is a real test. We're just really open to what's coming in and seeing what's happening. Good stuff. Um, so, Bri, you have a list of a few questions there to, to, to kick us off, or a few tech tips. Uh, yeah, we've got one here um, from uh, Dan. I thought it was Dan Deej to begin with. But it's <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan DJ, I think it is. Um, he's saying, hey, Chris and Phil, uh, I'd like to know if you could show me a chain for Ableton for progressive and trance vocals and that he's using Ether. Okay, um, I wonder do we have any trans vocals? Have you any trans vocals on your hard drive? I don't have any trans vocals. This is a pretty new computer, so sadly. Do you have any vocals? Um, I think I should have some from the original Peak Time Trans course. I'll have a, a wee joke about in it. What do you like? What, Phil, what, what do you l like to do with your vocals, and especially trans? That's what we're known for. Uh, I mean, I've worked with, I've been lucky to work with singers like Audrey Gallagher. In fact, some would say discover singers like Audrey Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but her vocal is very open, very airy. Uh, and she was such a pleasure to work with. So to me, it was all about siblings with Audrey. If you th she, her vocal is very Celtic. Right? Yeah, I, I was the same with working with Penny. I always find that um, just tons of compression was always needed and... Uh, Love is a hurricane. I wonder, is this the full track? Love is a hurricane. Don't wake me if I'm... Yeah, we'll fire one of these in. Um, Yeah, compression, why we always find to be, um, you know, getting the, the, the vocal to sort of sit within a mix. I always tended to sort of have a, a few different compressors. I love the Waves um, R-Vox compressor. Yeah. Um, I'll have a play with this and... I, I think what we talked to the guys about, for me as a producer, the most important thing was performance. Getting, we can have, we can compress, we can EQ, we can use uh, melody and harmonize, all that stuff, retime things, repitch things in the studio. The one thing that a computer cannot do, in my eyes, is, is a performance. And I think that's... That was always key for me. What 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 are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you were more focused on the performance. I always I always had the impression I could fix things afterwards, which probably got me into more trouble than uh, was necessarily. I did a lot of vocal comping um back in the day, so I would take you know, I would maybe do fifteen, twenty, thirty takes and then I would sit and pinpoint each individual bit. So I was I was going through and taking almost individual words or, or two or three phrases and comping them together. And and how do, looking back at that process do you feel you got a performance then was it was a bitty or was it I, yeah so that to me that's a technical exercise yeah i mean ideally you'd want to get the performance first and then um you know and then try and piece together the right the right bits but some some things that you just you know when you when you let well, i think about it as well if you have a good singer they'll tend to deliver something similar every time and it's really just looking for those extra special bits maybe it's a you know the you know the way she's you know presented a particular word or or fallen down into another note or, or you know there's certain pitch pitch shapes or pitch bends that you know you can you know you can pick out or, or have a certain sound to them that you know then i would want to sort of include them from you know one from take one and one from take five and take six but did you always want take five take six or would could you have ever let take one be the one 
Um, you, we always find the earlier takes are probably the better takes. Is, I, I tell you what, what really opened my eyes to all this uh, while Phil works away trying to get... Some yeah, I'll, I'll crack on and sort of uh, show you a chain. I tell you what, what opened my eyes to this was, and I'm not name dropping here, but I'm going to drop a name. <laughs> uh, I was down in U2 studio uh, working and a, a friend of mine was the engineer. And it was, I mean, it was obviously in awe of being in the studio and I was kind of going, where, where, where do you do the vocals? And he said, Bono lifts the nearest mic. And that could be an SM58, 57 from a snare drum. He will just, if he feels it, if the band are jamming and he feels the performance coming on, he lifts a mic. Now, we'd never use a Neumann or headphones. Is that only because it's Bono? You know, if you had a, a proper singer in, would you, would you let them go to that, those lengths? Or, or is, do you think that's indicative of capturing a vocal performance, that the vocalist has to be so comfortable that they can just wander about and, you know... I think that's my point, is that was all about the performance it was about he uses a 58 with no pop shield no headphones and it's because he wants to give a performance and it's up to the engineer and the producer and uh, the mastering to sort that vocal out afterwards okay so assume we've got the performance yes although sure. i don't <laughs> i'm not sure that i think there's a few tuning issues with okay. this this one but well uh what do you what do you Love put on your tunes normally? Or does it does it is it very, very specific to that, that the pain it's very specific. Vocal. I would and never have I, uh, I was listening to some you. producers talking the other day and they were talking about Sounds their vocal weird. chain and it was this, you know, they, they ran off this Love is a chain hurricane and, like, oh, it on this, you know, the singer, and washes away the pain and every All right. So surely it's about the uh, it's about the singer. It's about you know, I wouldn't have the same I would listen to the tone of the voice and then I would always do a compressor, obviously, and it was never one for our compressors or waves. It was always Logic Zone, so Logic Zone stuff. Yeah, so you can take us through the, the compressors. And yeah, well, the first thing I would always do is put a, a compressor a with a, a fast attack and a slow release, and, washes away and this the just sort of pain tends to even out. And everything this I do tends to even out the uh, the sort of overall levels. Love is just trying to work out our balance between our mics and our <laughs> and the washes audio there. So sorry if you couldn't hear that last stuff. Um, so yeah, a, a slow compressor, fast attack and slow release with a fair bit of ratio. And this will just tend to knock off a, a fair bit of reduction and sort of even out the, the level of it. Do you, do you use that when you compress it so much? It depends if it's, I, I think it depends as well. If, I think it depends as well if it's in a breakdown or you're trying to compete with the rest of a full track. If you're in the midst of a chorus, mm -hmm. You know, I tend you tend to have to compress things more and lose a lot more dynamics because you want it to sort of sit in that pocket of the tune. Whereas I think if you're in a breakdown, you can afford the dynamics a bit more room. I, you you know me, and I'm not Mister Compressor. Yeah, I. You want to let it all flow. Yeah, I really like to let everything breathe. I don't. I to me, some pop songs at the moment hurt my ears because they're so heavily compressed. So I love that sound. I know, <laughs> I know you do. And we've discussed this and you're a compressor and everything and and I fall into that trap that I think sometimes I've compressed pads and I, I, I'm, I've stopped and went, why am I compressing a pad? It doesn't need compressed. I've always, and I've never liked, you know, when you get a master in and it's just black, the waveform is just pure black. Hate that. I think it's just... It's horrible. Mm. I like to, so I would always gently compress things, uh, and especially vocals because I think it can, it can just squeeze the life. The other thing that I think is really really important, and, and this actually was something that I came up against when I was doing um, the peak time trance course where I got this vocal, um, and it was after this I got this vocal. I went out and bought a new mic <laughs> and, and a new preamp because of, uh, the difference in quality from I was using the mic that I'm using now. It's a road. Um, M three, yeah, yeah, Rode M three, which, which is is sort of um, based on the AKG C one thousand, I think is is the mic that it's sort of modelled on, which is a sort of drum overhead mic. It's not ideal for vocals, and we Penny just came down to the studio for the day to record the vocals, and we sort of used that mic. And there's just a tonality to it that you can never EQ out or or get rid of. You know, from a, was it a harshness or a just a you know it just didn't. It's hard to describe. It's sort of a I don't know, a muddiness that or you're not getting mm -hmm. that open sound you get with a you know, large diaphragm sort mm -hmm. of mic. So I think, you know, to get that real pristine, I got a Rode NT2 eventually after that and the, the difference in quality, just you could hear the breadth of the vocal just sort of opening out and it just, you know, you got that nice bite at the top end. You could 
breathiness and airiness. Whereas you can sort of hear, I'll turn the compressor off on this and let you hear. So sorry, this vocal was recorded with, with the, the M3. The yeah. Rode M3, so it's Love not that. Love is a hurricane and washes away the pain and everything I do, I do for you. And you, you can almost hear a nasaliness coming through and, and a sort yeah. of a flatness and a, almost a almost compressed sound already. You know? yeah, yeah, so I don't yeah. think that's a great place to start with a vocal because, you know, you're you're already sort of down a road and it's hard to EQ that out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll we'll try and work with it anyway. Um, Love is a hurricane and washes away the pain and everything. The, the 1K mark is sort of where the vocal has most sort of intensity. So this is the sort of area where, you know, you have to be the m sort of most careful, but it's also the area that's going to affect the sound as much as possible. Love is a hurricane and washes away the pain. You can sort of hear there the different elements of the of the vocal coming through i'll just boost a sharp boost and you can sort of hear you can hear this the sibilance in certain areas you can hear the breathiness in certain areas you can hear the the attack of the sounds in certain areas so depend on what your vocal has or what you want to try and bring out you can sort of play with these different areas love is a hurricane and washes away the pain and everything i do i do for you so just to stop you there, Phil. So what what you're doing, <clears throat> and it's a, a good technique, is boost, and then sweep up and down the frequencies. Yeah, just sort of you can. So you're sort of you're um, basically just sort of picking out the key areas of the vocal. You're really exaggerating the key areas that you that you want to the, maybe the hard bits, and then you pull the whole EQ back. A bit. Yeah, you can yeah. pull the whole EQ back. I mean, it's hard to sort of pick out what. Love is a hurricane. And washes away the pain. I'm sort of listening to that and thinking that it's not enough air, but I can I can sort of knowing that that's because of the mic and it's going to be hard mm -hmm. to bring that out if it wasn't already there in the first place. Um, so yeah, I'll probably bring a wee bit of air out. Love is a hurricane. And then you have to be careful of sibilants if you're sort of if you bring stuff out of that area. Your sibilants tends to be that sort of five five to ten k sort of area. Love is a hurricane. And washes away the pain. What about her lows there, Phil? Love is a hurricane. Um, That's a wee bit harsh. Right? <laughs> a wee bit harsh. Yeah, again, it depends. If, if, if I don't like to cut too much of the low out of the vocal. Mm -hmm. but, no, I, I don't. I, I, I don't like thin vocals either. It's, to me, it sounds cheap. You yeah, know, I mean, there's... sometimes you sort of need it depending on how you've gone with your, your track. Yeah. Love is a hurricane. If you are doing a, a, a roll off, try and do it sort of, you know, with a low cue. Love is a hurricane. Uh, do you want to explain? Washes to away the pain. And uh, yeah, well, Q is basically your, your resonance or the sharpness of your your EQ curve. It's how many frequencies you're you're affecting? Yeah, less or more. Okay. Love is a obviously generally speaking the sort of lower the Q, the more natural it'll sound. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be sort of having sharp spikes or. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. So, so we've got a love is a hurry. Got a compressor, an EQ. Yeah, I have a limiter just for the end normally. Do do you DS? Um, it depends if it if it needs it. I'll do it after the after the fact. I'll sometimes only DS say the reverb or something, mm -hmm. or or the channel going into the reverb. But it very much depends on. Can you explain why you would DS a reverb? Just G DS the signal going into the reverb means you oh, can right, sorry, right. you can boost you can boost the frequencies. A lot more on the airy, breathy bit. I'll show you. I'll do it now. Okay. Um, yep. We can have a have a look. I think I've got ether here. Should do somewhere. So we'll try and I'll make try and make a sort of really lush, big sort of reverb. I've, I've got a. I wonder did I save one? Plates for me tend to work a bit better for vocals. Yeah. For, for those out there who don't, don't know, a, pl a plate literally was a massive sheet of metal Yep. in a big, long, thin room. And at one end was a speaker, and at the other end Love is was a, a, a mic. And they would play the, the vocal down, and it would reverb off the, the big metal sheet. And that's that's where plates come from. Love is a hurricane. And so what you can do is, if you want to sort of um, really boost your your EQ or your reverb you can stick a EQ before it so you maybe want to just sort of boost the real brightness of that 
Local. But you can hear there on the S's, you're getting these sort of um, bursts of, of reverb. Love is a hurricane and washes away the. And um, we can put a deesser on there then just to um, take those out. So we've got our deesser. And I'm putting this on before the reverb. So it, it means I'm not. I, I can be more aggressive with a deesser before the reverb because you're still getting the S's and mm -hmm. um, stuff before. But it means I can really sort of squish that reverb up and sort of, you know, make it more lush. And well, it, I've never. I've actually never seen this technique. I'm quite interested. In Love is really a hurricane. And washes away the pain And everything I do, I do for you Love is a hurricane And washes away the So we're not getting those bursts of mm -hmm. reverb now when, on the S's and stuff like that So it just means you can sort of You've got a bit more room to play with on your So this is on your EQ bus You have a, the, oh, sorry, your uh, on, on a return, reverb yeah. return bus, yeah you have an, an EQ boost in the real highs. You're de-essing that at the particular points. Yeah, so, so the, not all of it. It's not just, all, it's just the S's, yeah. the ch ch And that really gives us a real airy, bright reverb. Love is a hurt. And then if you really want to go to town, you can stick a reverb on after the after the compressor. Love is a hurricane. Oh, and washes away. Or, yeah, and compressor just, on after yep. the reverb. And again, that'll just bring the, the reverb volume up. Another technique um, is to sidechain your vocals against your reverb so we've got our vocals on audio one and again this just enables you to have a, have a bigger reverb tail but you're not losing the sort of definition of of the vocal so you're you're ducking you're the ducking reef, you're ducking the, the reverb when the vocals on when the vocals on yeah and then when love is a hurricane and washes away the pain and everything and again, it's it means you can feed a bit more signal into the reverb and you can sort of turn it up a bit. Love is a hurricane and washes away the pain. It's almost, almost pre-delay, isn't it? I do it. Is it? Yeah, it's kind of like a, like a pre-delay, only you're not... You set. don't have to agree with me, you know that. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe it is. Yeah. So um, what, what are your views on chorus and stuff like that what to get you know i would i would tend to do multi takes as opposed to adding chorus if i wanted to widen a vocal out i would i would do more takes as opposed to put any so you get the vocal to detate double track it yeah so re-sing it exactly the same pan it probably Eleven. 10 o'clock 11 2 o'clock pan it the full way I you would, go full I would go, oh. full I would go full with with double tracks as long as you got one in the middle I would like a vote on that. Anybody out there would like to vote because I think it's a bit extreme to go hard left, hard right. But well, there, I think that's probably enough on vocals. Have so we any, any other we questions, got, or uh, is there any questions about the vocals first, or anyone asking any, Bry? No, there was just uh, uh, the essence. Um, yeah, <laughs> cool. See, we 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 know what's coming in. We prompt you. Uh, Sky London would like uh, some tips on starting a tune. And Phil, I would really love some tips to start <laughs> I, <can tunes>. <laughs> I, I, I can start tunes all. Tune? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Finishing the tune. Uh, I think it's Sky London. Uh, I presume that's not your real name, but uh, if it is, it's awesome. Uh, it's hard. It's it's really it's hard to start a tune, isn't it? I I, I find it quite the opposite. I, I I really enjoy starting the tune. That's my. The, I the think what what the listeners or viewers will find throughout this is we're completely <laughs> we are we tend to have totally opposite polar opinions on everything. I I, I th think because I love playing keyboards, I'll just sit, get a sound, and just sit and play, and I'll happily play for two or three hours, and just record bits and pieces, and mm -hmm. then you know I'll go back over what of what of. I always start with music, mm -hmm. and never start with drums if I'm starting the tune because I don't. I don't think there's anything to be. You can always you can always find drums and you can always get stuff going, you know. But finding finding a really nice melody or or a, an idea to spark it or playing with synths and just sort of messing about. I think yeah. Pl I mean, one thing I I love to do is literally switch off lights, have a, a the sort of glow of the screen, and just sit and noodle and play anything. It's not, mm. It doesn't have to be dance. It doesn't have to be house or trance or just anything. The the music at the start with the test card. Just play anything, and you you get strange sort of something will spark. Then Where you know, try? starting a tune. Uh, I start with I do the sort of skipping through um, sounds. A I'm a sampler. You're a sampler. Uh, yeah, I think uh, originally when I started making music, 
I didn't really know how to uh, play keys or anything like that there. And, um, and still don't. So <laughs> I still don't know how to play keys or anything like that there. So uh, I sort of started with, I think it was Soundforge or something I had, and I used to load in uh, as old of a song as I could find and flick through in almost like a half a bar loop and find sounds and then export them out. And I go through maybe 20 tunes and then I would just go through a whole list of those wee random samples and build a new loop out of it, sort of four bar loop out of that. And that's how I started because I was more into the sort of funky high stuff and it was all kind of sampled horns and stuff like that. And I think if you listen to your stuff, <coughs> it's very short, blippy, bloppy. Yeah. That's that's your style. Again, I'm the I opposite. Like it's a very popular style again. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that sort of coming back, you know, with the samples and real yeah, short cuts. I think, it, I think it, it all it all left um, around about two thousand and sort of five, and it went very minimal and things went drummy and very technical. Yeah, and, and I think that is. I almost think people have started to get a wee bit bored of that, and the live sampling stuff starting to come back again, and the the funky house is starting to make an emergence. Yeah, funky yes, house. funky house. Play that funky music. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Are we other, any other questions? Any other questions? The uh, what do you guys think of the Fab Filter plugin series, mainly the compressor and EQ? I'm going to I'm going to refer you to my colleagues on my left here. Uh, okay. I have the com or I have the EQ here. I played with the compressor on a demo, but I didn't really um, get much of an Im impression of it. A compressor for me, I've I've never been like over wowed by any particular. Compressor? Compressors. No, I mean, well, as long as it, I can hear it doing something or nothing, if you yeah, know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, some are maybe more a bit smoother, a bit more liquid than others, but I think it's it's it uh, it's it's doing quite a specific, specific job, specific technical j job. I I I think it was because I we started off with the Behringer. Do you remember the old Behringer yes. hardware compressor? And they were just solid wee tanks. Yeah. And um, they didn't they didn't impact your sound. They just give you the control. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the point. Compression for me is more about control of a sound mm -hmm. than adding or removing a quality it, to the sound. It's not an effect. It's not an effect. It's yet. it's a tool. If I wanted the add, if I wanted the add sort of an analog richness or something, I would add a saturator or or yeah. or put it through something or a preamp or you know that's where I would tend to look f to give it those sort of sounds with a compressor. The the most impressive compressors I've used are the ones to give you the most detailed control. And you know they give you the most. I actually really like Ableton's compressor because I think it's got a lot of options. It's got you know old school mm. opti opto compressors. It's got you know a few feedback models. You know, so yeah, you yeah. sort of create quite a lot of different sounds. And you know some of the emulations of um, like the nineteen seventy six are really really useful. Good, you know, patch. Like, again, it's it's, it's plugins. Again, I'm I'm just a little weird from everybody. Uh, I don't tend to use other people's plugins. I use Logic, and that tends to be it. Uh, a game with the EQs, because I, I find well, it does I, everything I want. EQs where I would. I think now, e EQs, they're, they're definitely a vast difference in quality. I was just about to go on from compressors. Between. EQ there is, with if you get the Sony Oxford EQs or, yeah. or something like that, there are a world of difference. Yeah, I mean, I'm control. A, Sony Oxford was, was the, <coughs> one of the first really expensive plugins that I bought. Uh, uh, this is back 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was the only, it was the only EQ plugin in the, on the market that was really, really good. And it was, the difference in the top end was where you noticed it the most. And Fab Filter is, without doubt, one of the best sound in EQs about. And it's got some amazing um, features. What, what, Love is a hurricane. I'll just go in through some of the stuff here. And everything I do. do um, yes, yeah, so you've got an analyzer mm -hmm. straight in, which I suppose you're already Love familiar with. You've got in Logic. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so having an analyzer in your EQ just instantly gives you more information. You know what I mean? It gives you the ability to sort of really fine tune what you're sort of. It, you know, combines that thing of eyes and ears, really, you know what I mean? So you can sort of listen to your ears, and then you can really dial in with what's happening. Um, and it's just really nice sound. Again, EQ is, if it sounds good, that's all you really need to know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and if it's got the control you need. It sounds good means that you've got, you've got a sweetness to things, and, and when you move something, you can hear it and feel it, and it just it enhances everything. It's not You're not moving things vastly differently to try and get it to work is that yeah am i explaining I that correctly yeah yeah right. absolutely i mean uh, i th i think we c we can we can go back to uh the old 
Mackie Mackie Digital. Desk. Mackie Desk, right. Me and Phil bought these. They were £10,000, what, two nineteen ninety nine, And we thought these were the dog's nuts. These, yeah. were, these were the best. And it's only when you hear a Sony Oxford, you realise that they were... Terrible. <laughs> absolutely dreadful. And you were constantly... Fighting you, with EQ. You're fighting with EQ and your mix would collapse. Your mix would just become... The more channels you had, it become muddier. Whereas these these EQs uh, just I think the, open everything. The other thing that I, over the years that I've sort of... Um, notice more about my productions is I tend to search longer for a sound rather than spending time EQing it. Yeah. Would, you know, whereas previously, like my EQ curves were like, you know, <laughs> I'd have like stuff up here and stuff up here. And, I, you know, I was I was always trying to like crowbar stuff out of out of the sound. You were trying to create the sound yeah, through EQ? Yeah, create the sound through EQ, where now I'm, I'm much more likely to spend more time programming the synth or getting a better sample or re-recording the vocal or whatever whatever it is to try and get it as close and then your EQ curves start to come you know come down and be a lot more subtle in your and then you're just using EQ to move it out of the way or, or to place it in it and yeah it well yes yeah, was that I mean that is that there's there's two sort of areas to EQ I suppose there's the sort of tonal shaping where you're getting the sound to sound exactly as you you want it and then there's the mix down part where you know you're trying to fit your sounds together with other sounds so mm. i think it's two distinct areas you'd maybe almost use two separate eqs but fab filter is an absolutely great tool for the job so definitely recommend do, it. do we know price on this um i think it's a couple of hundred bucks isn't it somewhere around there uh i can't remember i believe it is if it's a discount it yeah i think we think we are working on a, a discount with fab filter for um our other plugins so check check back with that one so they've, they've suddenly just become a much better uh if you go to youtube phil and um, we're looking for Kerry Chandler. This one? Yep, that's... Oh, Mommy, what's that record? Is this a question? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, this is the strings, wasn't it? Yeah, this was the strings. So let's uh, have a question. listen. This is from Alan Dixon. And he tweets... What does he tweet? Look for strings for Yeah, if you can find the strings sound. Alright. Is that old Detroit techno? Yeah, sounds like sounds sort of like live strings. Um Brian told me we couldn't do this in Anna, but <laughs> I told him we could. <laughs> uh yeah, I mean this is one of the things actually that um I I added this sample to Anna specifically for this. It's really, really hard to program real sound and strings on a on an analogue synth, so um that's why we sampled some for Anna. And it's it's got a real sort of it's almost like uh, sampled off an old record vibe, the strings. Mm -hmm. So let's hear the strings we got. Doesn't sound like strings. Okay, so there we go. We've got some basic strings, and need to turn our key track on. So key key track allows it to go up and down the keyboard. Is that it? And it's yeah. You can either have just it, I'm playing a load of different keys here, and it's just yep. hitting the same note. Yep. Or key track will track okay. like, like a normal sound. Um, in that um, Kerry Chandler tune sounds like there's a bit of high pass filter. And it's sort of rising up, isn't slow it? Attack, it's a slow very attack. slow attack, yeah. It's very much, uh, very much like the Mellotron, isn't it? Yeah, it's got that sort of old school vibe. And the, the reason the slow attack was Mellotron was actual tape, cassette tape. So when you had a key, a cassette tape started, and it, that sort of vroom is as the tape started. Did, did, did I have a cassette tape for each... Nope. Note. I'm or not sure whether it, it sped it. You know, I think it maybe had like eight, didn't it? And yeah. then you play keys and it'll spare them up. So you would, you would hear the Mellotron on Strawberry Fields Forever. And it's a real old 60s synth. Uh, you've probably seen the plug-in as well. Um, so if you want to add a bit more of a sort of dirty vibe to it, we can turn our amp sim on. And the amp sim on Anna is, is a virtual recreation of it going through a speaker cabinet. So it'll give you that sort of... 
guitar amp sort of vibe. And we can sort of adjust the dry wet to give it a bit of the original sound as well. Play with a high pass to sort of fine tune how much of the low end you want. And then if you wanted to, you can have a bit of uh, filter on top. It's probably pretty low, is it? Maybe a bit of a slower attack, yeah. So that sounds pretty close. Yeah, that yeah. sounds pretty good. So, so hopefully, Alan, uh, that answers your question on the, the Kerry Chandler house and gives you a bit of a background information uh, info on that actual sound. Uh, ben Evans wants to know uh, tips on getting music signed to a label. Make good music. Yeah. <laughs> and my big tip is you can do it yourself nowadays. You know, it's real. It is. It's the time to do it yourself. You don't have to have a label. If you're prepared mm. to put in the work, the time, you know, why Why would you sign a label nowadays, Phil? I would sign to a label if I was getting on a label where I wanted to get gigs with other DJs who were on the label and the, and the label were known for doing tours. That would be... The, the so, Bedrocks, Armadas, yeah. labels like that. Labels that are, you know, take... take uh, any, any any of those big labels will take you on as a... As, mm -hmm. uh, will take your DJ in and your, and your production, you know what I mean? So they'll take you right across the board so you, normally. You want to tie it all in as one, yeah. you know. As well, you have to. I think you have to nowadays. I mean, that's, that didn't used to be the case. You used to have a sort of different agency for your. You know. Yeah, I, I, when I started out, uh, probably, you know, four hundred years ago. Four hundred <laughs> years ago, <laughs> before the invention of the cylinder sound, uh, you did. It was. It was. You signed your label. They primarily all. They, all they did was release your records. Your DJ agent got you gigs i think now it is all combined yeah it's, it's what they call 360 360 deals yeah yeah so it's publishing your dj your image rights everything so look at the label ask the label what they're going to do for you you know if, if it's one one single deal I, th yeah. I think there's a bit of kudos as well on getting on a you know if there's a label you if you really yeah. like you know there's kudos and you know I, I got on that label my yeah. track must be good enough the one thing that i would say is if you're having difficulty getting signed a label I, throughout my career the tracks that were really good people phoned you the tracks that were really bad never got signed but, yeah and i think that's you know i think that's the cold hard facts of it you know if if your tracks are good enough you won't have too much of a problem yeah. getting them signed but i also I, I also think you know do it yourself you know set up yeah i mean uh, it's 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 easier than that. i mean we <laughs> we used to always bang on about uh, uh, you know we should do this ourselves you know but we, can't we can do it better we can't because we don't have the money yeah yeah but now you don't need any money you know you don't need a dis distribution deal you don't need you know, money to print records, print CDs, you know, do posters, do advertising, do a promo run. You, you, you know. do Twitter now, you do Facebook, you, you know, try and put on your own nights, you get it out there in the ether and start promoting it, YouTube, whatever. So, yeah, I would go. Uh, have we any signs that we're going to take a look at? Yeah. Well, before we do that, can I just jump in and why we got Anna up on the screen? Yeah. There was something about the precepts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was a guy on the on the forum just Can I asking. Stop? Was not an awesome question. That was a great, great question. <laughs> <It really was. laughs> Sorry, that was a joke from earlier. Uh, yeah. So basically, one of the guys in the forums was asking about sort of saving and loading presets on Anna, and uh, I'll just sort of briefly explain explain how this works. Um, we have a series of um, built-in categories, and for the meantime, and this will be updated in a future version, um, these are static, so you can't create your own. It'll only recognize the categories that are already built in. So when you save a preset, um, hit Save As, and it'll bring up uh, all your folders. And you can only save in the folders that have already been created. If you create a new folder and save it in there, Anna won't recognize that as, as part of... Um, as part of its category. So pick a category. Name your song or sound and away you go. If you did want to transfer presets from you know yourself to your mate or whatever, um you can get to the, the folder and sort of drag and drop them. So you go to your Mac this is just for Mac only. Um PC is slightly different, I'll explain that in a wee second. Um go to Macintosh library application support 
Sonic Academy, and then Anna presets. And that'll give you a factory bank, and it'll give you access to all the presets. And you can drag and drop them, but you must, if someone's sort of shared a preset with you with that dot preset um, name, you just have to drop it into one of the categories. On the PC, um, the folder is uh, your C drive, program data, uh, forward slash uh, Sonic Academy, forward slash Anna, forward slash presets. So you can go in there and uh, do the same thing, drag and drop between different things. So that's it. it we will be updating this in future versions. We've, we've sort of been working on... Um, dynamic category so the, in the file menu you'll be able to sort of um, create a new category and then save stuff to that category or load, load stuff from different categories and move stuff about and then there'll also be a box for factory presets and then user presets so there'll be another level up from category which will be your preset bank and you'll be able to create your own preset banks and then obviously we'll be giving away banks and different stuff as well so here we go Chris any other exciting questions Bri? It's just a get that sound on uh, Spartak uh, Ricochet, I think it is. It's pretty straightforward. Do you want to do this one, Brian? Uh, we'll go ahead. We'll go YouTube Spartak. Spar T A Q T A Q T E U E uh, Ricochet. <laughs> That's it. I used to know him. Okay, and Ricochet. Oh, yeah. One minute fifteen. <laughs> Yeah, so just the wee bleepy noise. It sounds basically just like a it's just a soul wave, yeah. is it? Um, I think it is, just a sort of... Yeah, a fine pulse. Why would it switch? <laughs> I think that's pretty close. Uh, I'll have a listen again, just to make sure it's not just that. A bit of chorus and stuff on it? Yeah, I think there is a bit of... So yeah, a bit of chorus on there, and then I guess we should throw a bit of delay on just for good measure. It's pretty easy one, that. <laughs> Wish they were all that. <laughs> yeah. they're all that so easy. If, if you could just post a uh, hashtag easy sounds <laughs> to Sonic Academy Live. Brian's just looking for some questions here. Yeah, it was just a lot of questions. Um, Trying to get one. Guys, I'm dying to know how did Swedish House Mafia get the subby kick with the click on top and how you process it? Any hidden secrets? This, um, can I just sorry, this this will be Phil Johnson's speciality. Oh, don't say that. I was, <laughs> I was just going on. Pressure. This. Um, one thing I actually noticed, uh, and I got a, got a new set of speakers recently. I got a set of BM15s and I've got um, like 10 inch cones on them. And I used to have a set of Mackies, and I was going through all uh, all my different tracks, just sort of listening. Oh, I've oh, got brand new speakers. So let's hear what everything sounds like. And I was listening to a lot of the sort of um, Dutch house hardware and stuff like that, and their kicks were really solid and low, and you know mm -hmm. had a lot of depth to them. And then I stuck on Swedish House Mafia one, and it just seemed like their their track just didn't fill the same frequency spectrum but on, on stuff like the Mackies where the where the, or the Mackie speakers when the bass was compressed it sort of filled filled it out and, I'm, and I'm, it sort of made me think you know in a club system mm -hmm. with a lot of limiters on the bass yep. you know yep. you get that a lot if you have a sort of a thinner mix will the will the speakers compensate so I just I mean obviously when you when you listen to Swedish House Mafia stuff out live you know, it sounds sounds massive, but yeah. do you think they're restricting that frequency range on purpose to, to let the, the let, let the speakers or let the limiters and clubs sort so of so the limiters aren't kicking in, crushing the sound. They're letting it's back to my not compressing too much, letting it breathe type mm. sort of. I I, do, I don't I mean we'll it's, have a quick listen here. I think can I tell? I mean most I'd say ninety percent of club systems are set up really badly. Uh, I know the guys here uh, in Belfast, the 
they fly function one guys in probably once a month once every two months to tune their system uh it really does make the difference you know these speakers it, it's been a massive reveal to me between the, the speakers you got the what are the bird uh, the dyn audios yeah bm the Mackies. 15s, yeah it, it was because we've we've lived with Mackies for 10 years and yeah and we've known nothing else and now these are just incredible so i'll i'll just let you listen to that's uh, until one where have we got what, one It's like not a lot of body in it. It is just a click, you know, at the top with a sub. And I'll let, I'll that let does, yeah. There, there's, I mean, there's, there's something there probably about fifty or sixty hertz, nothing, um, and then a click. You know, you listen to that, and it's, you know, it's a lot boomier. It's a lot more solid. Um, so if you want to create it, I mean, you can create. I'll, I'll show you one with Anna, and then I'll show you one, um, just with like an eight hundred eight. Uh, so. And Annie, you can create kicks really easily. And um, we're going to create a kick using a sine wave, and then we we'll use the GN to uh, pitch. So what we want to do is just create a nice pitch curve. And to get the click, you just make a really thin. Click at the start. And then we put another curve in there, and this gives you your sort of body of your kick. Turn the loop off. So you've got that sort of low end sub. Yeah. Drop it like it's hot. Yeah. Drop it like it's hot. <laughs> 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 and so the the uh, the higher this note is, sort of more close to an eight oh eight or nine oh nine you get. And you can play about. So this is <clears throat> a pure sine wave yep. that you're just manipulating the pitch on, yeah. The pitch and an envelope on. Yeah. And that, I mean, <clears throat> it's quite, it just shows you when, when you know what you're doing, which Phil sometimes does, is what you can, with very little what you can create. You don't need to have four kicks layered up in a sampler and all, you know, that is a sine wave and you're adjusting the, the pitch and the, the envelope to create a 909, a sort of squeaky kick, a drop. You can, yeah. You can create four or five sounds out of that one. If you uh, add a compressor on as well, it'll just add a LN 976 or 97, 1976. It's fine-tuned to sort of manipulate clicks. So you can get good body from... And then you can play with the attack as well to sort of change your kick. And the rate will change the click as well. So when you find a click you're happy with, you can then play with the rest of it. So what do you, what do you think makes Swedish House Mafia kicks special? Um, I... I I think all of this stuff is balance, isn't it? You know, it's mm -hmm. it's the balance of the kick versus the rest of the chin, and um, I think I, th I mean, I think it's their ordinary kicks. They're nothing particularly great, but <laughs> what's around them is also incredible yeah. as well. You know, that's I think most of their battles won with the music and the groove and the, the yeah. Sound if the kick if their kick sounded slightly different, it wouldn't. No one be going, "Oh, that track's terrible." You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, you have to have a kick that sounds decent, sounds well in a club. I think the other thing as well that, that these guys have a massive advantage over on any DJs really is they play their stuff every night of the week mm -hmm. in a club with the best sound systems in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, So they're hearing their stuff on, on top class speakers week in, week out. They can bring a laptop down. They can plug their stuff in. They can try a new mix. Go, oh, tonight the, the kick didn't sound that great. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow night, try, try a wee bit of this on it. You know, we're going to you know try lowering the 
compression on the kick or try you know a bit more eq yeah, yeah. and go out the next night and go that kick sounded awesome yeah, you know yeah. and again it comes back to that thing we were we were saying about the speakers you know mm-hmm. for years we'd been using mackies and we were hearing one thing and then we got these and we were like whoa you know where did all this other stuff go and, and, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of guys out there probably are using you know two three hundred pound speakers yeah. or or a pair of headphones and it, yeah. you know it, the difference between your car your stereo your headphones you know your speakers a club yeah they're vast, you know what I mean? To be able to get a something that works on all of those is extremely challenging if, if you don't have, you know, a really nice set of monitors to, to sort of work on. So the advice would be if you've got any mates who DJ, you know, get them down, get them on their warm up or whatever and go here we fire this through the system. I mean me and Paul when we were DJing, I would always go down and check our, or go down early and check our chins. You but know, the, but it's a different th- sound when there's yeah, no one in the say, club. Yeah, there's there's nobody in the club and it is a, I mean, a scary thing DJing in clubs with really good sound systems. Uh, it's almost like DJ at home. I remember going into Zook, and it's got it's got a, a Gary Stewart sound system. The guy did Paradise Garage and stuff in New York. This is a quarter of a million pound uh, system that's tuned, and it was horrible to DJ in because you could hear everything in a in a really rubbish ropey PA. You, <laughs> you can get, get away, away with, with so much more. But then it was a true when you heard a great record like a Super Tab or eight record or something. It was just this is mega this and half your battle is won because the audience are getting this beautiful crystal clear subby beautiful warm sound Mm -hmm. and that just and it also allows you as a dj to free up to play much sparser records much deeper records Mm -hmm. it allowed you to go on that journey because you weren't having to ram it through the speakers if if that makes sense um and one one of the things when we were sort of when i was djing and we had a function one down in the kitten where we were residents and the difference the small the different small bits of EQ and makes at that level is massive. You yeah. know, I, I would I would play a lot of stuff off Ableton. I did a lot of live type stuff. Yeah, yeah. And kicks that you know sounded slightly different at home when you played them out were like, whoa, turn that kick down, or you know, where's all that bass coming? You know, and, yeah. and it was it was so dramatic. And and again, that's what so that feeds back to the difference between you know if you're listening on a, on a set of speakers at home, you know, the tiny adjustments that you're making on those speakers at home that you might not be hearing. Uh, when that, when magnified. That ex- yeah, when that's expanded on the big cl- club yeah. system, it's magnified. So if you can get a club club system, check that's, your kicks out. I, can I, I say good club system? You know, there's there's no but point. I, but even it, even it's, it's even the you. loud, you know, even if it's not like that brilliant yeah. a club system, the the bottom end will still give you a, a good indication of comparison between you know tracks that you know sound good and and your own stuff. Well, Phil, I think that's a. A natural uh, point. We've uh, been on air for an hour now. Just take a 10-minute break. Guys, please keep the questions coming through Facebook, through the, the site, through Twitter, wherever you want. We're here to answer them, and hopefully you're getting something out of this. Cool. Okay, we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes, and we'll leave you with some uh, awesome music while, while we go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you in a minute. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, we just had a quick short break there, as you're probably aware of. Um, yeah, we're just going to start off this half by uh, talking about a few things that are upcoming on Sonic Academy. Um, we have uh, a new tutorial. Is that it? Yeah, Deep House. Um, uh, I've got a video here of the playthrough, so let us uh, have a quick listen to it. And then we're going to be looking at uh, a bit of Chris's new tutorial. Um so we'll fire Graham's up first here, and this is the walkthrough. And I will full screen. Hi there, and welcome to this How to Make Deep House course. Um, before we get stuck in, um, let's have a listen to the track that we're going to make. Thank you. 
Okay, so that's the uh, Deep House tutorial, and that'll be coming out end of this week sometime. Is that? Yeah, it should be out um, before this weekend anyway. Um, so we've had a question on the forum. Uh, this will be just a quick one about. Um, is that still playing? No, nope. not anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, just about snares, um, prodigy style snares, and we we covered a, a bit in the well, we covered a lot in the prodigy tutorial. But I'll just go over um, one thing that I've been sort of messing about with recently um, when I was making a sample pack. Um, so. I was all going so well, wasn't it, Phil? <laughs> yeah, need to reinstall that. Um, so this is a, a project, um, and this is specifically to create snares. <laughs> and basically what it is, I have um, a bunch of uh, snare sounds. Let me just see if I find the right key. Yeah, a bunch of snare sounds that sort of just loop round. And then I've got sort of uh, faders for each of them. And what I can do with these is... And these are just sort of s snare samples um, of different sort of kits. A lot of Ableton kits, 707, 909, the DMX, which are all classic ones. And you can basically just vary the levels. Uh, so you vary, vary the levels of all the different, you can sort of mix and match then um, the levels to sort of create unique snares. So that's one way of sort of making snares. Um, so I'll get a new live set. Um, and you can just sort of go through them, record a bunch, and uh, sort of split them all up again in something like Recycle and create all your own samples. The other thing that I use quite a lot, and this is a sample pack I got years and years ago, um, 70s breakbeats, and this has a lot of old school snare sounds. A little bit clicky, but you can sort of get rid of those. Um, and I think it's still available maybe on Zero G's website, possibly. Um, and the other thing for sort of uh, Prodigy style stuff, they used a lot of these type of loops in their tracks as well. There's like a, a loop there. And obviously with Ableton nowadays you can quantize everything. You could layer up a few different loops. Speed the whole thing up. Then add a few sort of bigger kicks in. We'll add a simpler in for a kick get some Sonic Academy symbols And then you can sort of group, say, some of your um, loops and then side chain them against the kick. Did you ever make big breakbeat, Chris? I used to, I started off making. That's right, I tricore, yeah, you were. Tri <laughs> what, you haven't heard of tricore? Tricore. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take you back to 1991. <laughs> uh, I My very first gig was with Jumpin' Jack Frost, Colin Dale. And I was seventeen year old in Portsmouth. Uh, we made Jungle, which was preceding drum and bass. So yeah, I, I love, I love breaks. The only thing that's weird, twenty years later, they're still using the same loops. I find. Yeah. Uh, moving on from the breaks, have you finished? 
Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, well, you can get those snares. I'll do one more quick thing. If you wanted to just take a snare out of um, your track, you can just slice the MIDI. Okay, and then we can go in and sort of... You can just take any of the bits out in the middle. So you can cut up loops. I, that's a good way to get those those tight sort of prodigy snares or or dubstep snares. A lot of them come from those classic breaks you're talking about. The Eamon break. The um, what's his name? Here's the drummer. Uh, hey, James. Yeah, James. James Brown. Hey. <laughs> 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 yeah, or Mrs. Brown, as that sounded like. Yeah, I think uh, I've got. Uh, and yeah, again, it's, it's, so so they're quite lo-fi retro snares. They're yeah, sixties and seventies yeah. funk funk. You can, if you Google sixties and seventies funk breaks, there's a couple of websites might have a couple of samples on there. Have you have you had a look at the Abbey Road sixty seventies drums? Have yeah, I played about with them a bit. And um, uh, I think the difficulty is programming those really nice loops. Uh, I think they're the they're the Abbey Roads ones are quite clean sound and drum kits mm -hmm. still you know what i mean they do sound they do have you know have that sort of slightly old school vibe but they still sound really so clean. they don't have the vibe because these are taking off vinyl so these yeah, are gonna I have think, i think all that adds to that sort of sound even the snares as well even if you're taking a clean you know if you take that clean snare i mean that sounds like uh, the start of uh bam 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 some prodigy track that I yeah. really did a bad impersonation <laughs> of. <laughs> yeah, just get some sort of twangy guitar in there and hey Preston, you've got a prodigy track. Uh, but moving on, uh, Flux or Fluxy, I think it is on the uh, the forums. Can you talk about how to get an audio clip or synth to have feedback? So I think feedback. Yeah, you're sort of talking about distortion them. and you know let's grunge yeah there's a lot of there's a couple of questions on the forums about this as well um i'm, I'm hoping it's all the sort of same question but um i'll load up uh an anna here and this is really i mean I've, I've you did this with your new tutorial as well your zed yeah you've been putting distortion on yeah i love in distortion I, yeah i mean i i there's a there's a very distinct sound to the, the some of the new stuff the Skrillex new yeah. stuff and some of the dubstep stuff and again it goes back up on earlier on the show we showed you the turning the amp sim on to get that sort of reduced frequency sound on the strings mm -hmm. and it's the same idea when you're sort of creating um, these basses so we'll just make a really simple um, bass here with Anna. <laughs> Bit of envelope on it. So real real simple bass. And I'll make a sort of just basic um quick synth line. A little bit total mess, but you never know. <laughs> So that's pretty decent there. Guitar Rig 4, um, genius for distorting basses. Um, the sound that I tend to find works best is uh, if you go into your guitar amps and go to the gratifier, the gratifier replicates the sort of rectifier dual um, tube heads and stuff that uh, you get from sort of heavy metal type stuff. <laughs> So it's, uh, instantly you're getting that sort of squealing sound and then if you put resonance on your bass so i'm thinking that's the type of sound that sort of feedbacky squelchy it, it, sort of it's literally it is doing what guitarists would do but putting synths through it is is and i've you, <clears throat> Go ahead, sir. You've got a lot of options with guitar rig. Again, this cab thing comes back to what I was talking about in Anna. Anna, we've got a sort of a, a simulated cab sound, and it's the same sort of idea. <laughs> So I think <clears throat> when you're doing that type of uh, sound, it, it, it all ties in with dubstep, which is very current and stuff now. You wouldn't apply this to 
a trans base, would you? No, probably not. Well, although you could play it to some sort of trans trancey leads, maybe some metal leads or something. Yeah, I, I have I've done sort of trans leads with with distortion and JP. There's a few people asking about Super Eight and Tab, guys. If you go to my uh, progressive trans course, mm. uh, <clears throat> that should give you some ideas about Super Eight and Tab. It was kind of based on those uh, Anjuna beats, Deep, Matzo. Uh, J Tech sort of yeah, guys. or if you have a YouTube clip there of the, of the specific sound you're after, post that up. Did they post a YouTube link? Did they post a YouTube link for the Super Eight and Tab? No. Give us a YouTube link. It just helps us sort of uh, go and find pick it. stuff out. Yeah. Um, and those guys. Uh, there's a question here um, on Twitter from Tim Vision. Um, guys, do you have any comments on making a switch from Cubase to Ableton? My creative flow sucks. Hence the switch. Yeah, I, I mean, I switched from Cubase to Ableton a few years ago. You didn't. You switched from Cubase to Logic. <laughs> I switched from Cubase to Logic ten years ago. At the peak of my career, I decided to switch programs and spent seven months just in a hellhole. Yeah, I mean, I think the Ableton's brilliant for for getting that that initial part. You know, it's really, really, really quick at getting ideas going. Um, but I don't like arranger. Arrange, arrange. Yeah. I'm not a fan of arranging Ableton. And I think quite the opposite of Logic. It's brilliant for arranging and getting. I think it tends to make different type of music. You make sort of more melodic and flowing music with Logic. You don't have to. You don't have to. But <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying to make a sort of a sweeping uh, statement. Can I just butt in here? See, I would just say, Tim, if you are using Cubase at the minute and you're thinking about changing to Ableton. I would advise not to do it because Ooh. I think it's the, the biggest oh. mistake that I made was, was switching really? to Ableton. Why? I think it's great in terms of, of getting ideas down, but mm -hmm. I find when I go back to my older tracks, yeah. they're more structured. They're, they, I think they sound a lot better because I was focusing more on arrangement at the time. Mm -hmm. And all my stuff now is kind of, I get a loop down and then I'm stuck and you're just... I just feel like you get stuck in a, a like an eight bar loop in, in Ableton and you can get no further. I, th I think if you look at Phil's iTunes, he has probably 50 tracks that are one minute eight. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's it. And yeah. it's so yeah. there's a whole album there of one minute eight tracks. Whereas, yeah, I, 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 I never, again, being a little weird and dancing to my own drum, I never got into to Ableton. I never liked it. I I find it too uh, toyish or something. Well, I've, I've, I, when I... Oh, I Come on, you can real, do it. I have this real hunger now, in yeah. at, like for for Ableton, and that it gets stuff done really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's why I, I feel like I can never go back to Cubase because every yeah, time, every I, time I go back to Cubase, mm. I just get, I just sit and I stare at it, and I'm just like, what is this? Like, it's, yeah. it's just so bad. You just can't get your ideas out. And I feel by the time, by the time you've got them out, then they're, they're it's like a diluted version of what you originally wanted, and then. I think if I had a stead with Cubase, I would have still been able to get that across. But now I, I know it can be done a lot quicker, and I can't make the I can't make the transition back. To I, the far steeper learning curve. This is almost like a Top Gear challenge. You you are Cubase, <laughs> you're Ableton, and I'm I'm Logic. Yeah, first and one to make a track in an hour. You, you're sitting still loading your drums in with Cubase in an hour. Like. Well, no, I think I think definitely you could even figure out how to work <laughs> Groove Agent, how to load a, how to load a sample into Groove Agent without layering it on top of five other sounds that all play at the same time. So that that's interesting. I mean, that that kind of shocked me that you've said don't move from Cubase to Ableton. I would say I would say move. I, I, I would say move to Logic. There you go. Thank you very much. I'd I, say I, I can't. I just can't fathom Logic. I, Why? It's, again, it's that thing of you know, if I have an idea, the the, the you know to, to capture that spark of your creative momentum, mm -hmm. it has to be done in that in that period. And I think Ableton's far better at capturing that. I think that the diff the difference is you don't arrange as much in Ableton, mm -hmm. whereas Cubase and, and Logic obviously force you to. But I think it's, it's it's a matter of discipline. You know, you have you just have to go into Ableton and arrange. I think the the thing is going into arrange in Ableton isn't that bad. It's just like Cubase and Logic, but and and it's almost the same as starting a track in in Cubase. You yeah. know, you've got that same you know mental block of I just cannot be bothered to arrange this out. One thing I've heard more and more recently is people getting their ideas down in Ableton. And then stopping at that point and bouncing them out and taking them to Logic and doing the, all their arrangements so and, stems. and uh, automation in, in Logic or in Cubase. Is, is there any, wa any way to sort of rewire from... Yeah, there is. There is. is uh, and do people not do that? 
again. You're still stuck in that loop thing, aren't you? Right, okay. Uh, I, I start off on logic, stay on logic, and love logic. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we cleared that up. Logic is not as good as Ableton or Cubase. I think there's only one way to settle this. <laughs> Fight! <laughs> okay, next question before we start a row. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to have a quick look at uh, Chris's new tutorial. Um, and we've got a link here for SuperTab, so while we're playing this, I'll have a look. Guys, by the way, this is a, this is a work in progress, so just bear with it. It is awesome. <laughs> Flat off.
believe it's Chris's new tutorial. Well, let me available, Chris. <laughs> uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Don't hold me to that. Don't hold me to that. Maybe not happen. Sometime soon. Uh, so we have a couple more questions. Oh yes, before we uh, before we go into that, um, just in case you didn't know, it's uh, you can watch the stream on your iPads and iPhones as well. Um, for any of you that are wanting to, I suppose the football's over now. Could someone tell us the score? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's only tweet the, tweet the score. Uh, Actually, good. well, no, I've got it recorded, but yeah, I suppose I'll find out oh, one way or another yeah. by then. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, if you haven't already checked it out, you can check it out on your iPad. Although on iPad, the the uh, delay is about I think 25, 30 seconds. Or I think on the well, website, it's only like four seconds or something. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. <laughs> I think you should get the uh, boffins in Sonic Academy to sort that out. I don't think it's something we can we do. We have uh, another question here in through Twitter. Uh, it's about groove. How do you keep the groove in your track interesting? Uh, 90s house tunes have great swing and beats never get boring. Yeah, um, I think... So. Yeah, I mean, there was a guy asked this on the, on the forums the other other day, and, and I think one of the things that you, um, I think this is the first step, but I think this is a small small part is that when you when you listen into your own tune for fifteen hours, mm -hmm. not nonstop, when you're making a track, you know the way you're hearing it's different than the way the person for the first time is hearing it. So the, the you know if you've got a decent groove, it playing for a minute doesn't sound as boring to them as, as it maybe has to you so i think after I, 15 I, hours yeah mm -hmm. you know when you're making your own tracks you're listening to the same thing over and over again and you, you you can feel the need to want to change stuff a lot and, and do things and keep adding stuff but you know if you a, a lot of the tracks i listen to in clubs you, they don't do an awful lot you know you mm -hmm. it is the same groove especially in obviously techno and you know house and deep house and stuff like that it's really about just getting a groove and, and letting it run you know and, and it's the other elements in your tune that you're using to sort of keep it interesting your breaks and add other elements in i it's one thing i struggled with as you can testify hmm. uh i wasn't particularly good at groove i never really understood it for but then you know your, a long your, time. your tracks were all about the arrangement and the flow of yeah. the songs and the on the this other sounds building up and i think that's you know was sort of saying you know that you know it's you know, getting a good basic groove is really all you need. It's the other elements on top that you know keep it interesting. Yeah, I think I, I think I suppose what what you're trying to say, you need you don't need just a good kick or just a good groove. It has to be a decent kick, a decent groove, a decent you know, and all those things can add up to something really special. I think the one thing that we've we've often talked about in tutorial and stuff is you can't teach us that. Dare I say X factor? You know that. What makes a tune special? What is what is that key element? Yeah. What is that? I mean, I I still have no idea how to make it. I know when I've got it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Absolutely. And the only way you can get it is by keep doing stuff until the you, thing happens that you go, that's it. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I think it's about being in the right place at the right time, making sure you're you're still, you know, you're putting in the time making beats. I mean, obviously there's, you know, there's stuff you learn that helps you get to that point quicker or you, you you try stuff in certain ways that enables you to you know to, to find those wee sparks of you know awesomeness that you know m can make your track different but it, I, I don't think adding uh was it mpc groove will suddenly make an all right track into a killer track yeah again i think groove for me different amounts of groove are are quite genre specific yeah, you know absolutely. trance you're not going to have a you know, a sixty percent swing shuffle groove on your on your no. track, it's not going to work. You know, on a, on a on a real funky techno track, you would. Mm -hmm. On a drive and straight te techno track, you're not. You know yeah, what I mean? Straight, I think yeah. it's very much a you know a part of the genre. So mm -hmm. I think listen to your genre. The other thing you can do now, obviously with Ableton, is extract a groove. You know, if, yeah. if if you're if you listen to a track and you think, oh, that the groove and that's great. You know, you can extract that, but it's probably not just the groove that's given the vibe. That, no, it's not. It's, of the track. It's, it's, it's the sound. It's yeah. the mix down. It's the compression. It's uh, that bit of reverb. It's that just. just Drum sounds or whatever. Yeah. It is, and and it, I don't think that you we can tell you how to get that special thing in the track. It's just you have to have, you have to grow in confidence to know that's it, and and you you know you you've all had those moments in the studio where you've I just went bum bum. That's yeah. I I do think you do build up a series of um, I don't know if it's tricks or um. It's weapons in your weapons, arsenal. Weapons in your arsenal. You know stuff that you've done previously that you know that definitely worked. Or, I mean, even even loops or or snares mm -hmm. or sounds or or I mean, we had, like, you did an entire album with one kick. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> and one, you know, it was all you know. You, Is that you, Wildfield? <laughs> 
but but you know what I mean. You had a you had a group of sounds that you know you use. You know you, you your album used you know a lot of the same effects and it, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't turn around as a rock album and go God, I can't believe he's using the same drum sounds in all his mm-hmm. tracks. Well, why not? You know what I mean. That's it's well, it's it's a, a good... sound pa- I, to me. The album had to have a sound palette. Yeah. So you were you know. I think you find that with artists in general. You know, you look at Swedish House Mafia. You look at you know other big artists. You know. Their tr- this general sounds in their tracks don't vary too, too much, much from one track to the next. You know yeah. they've got sounds that they know works or or variations of. Mm-hmm. You know and they sort of tend to stick stick with with it. Like that's great. That's quite so interesting. So any other questions or shall I do a bit of stutter editing? This yeah. is, this is probably oh here we go. Uh, can I just butt in with a really important? It uh, should we broadcast this live in case any. If you don't want to know the score of the match. Turn away now. <laughs> yeah. What is the score? So there you go. Chelsea won. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? Yeah, 1-0. Did they right enough? Wow. Ben Evans, this better be, uh, this better be true. Yeah, this better be true. <laughs> We've just ruined thousands of people's lives. Uh, this is something... I haven't had a chance to play with this. I'm very interested in it. Yeah, I was... Uh, again, a couple of questions came up in the forum the other day about, you know, complex tro and editing and, you know, stutter edits and is it cheating to use stutter edit and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I give Isotope a shout and ask them to throw me a copy, which they were very kind to do. And this is this is developed in conjunction with uh, BT? Yeah, with BT. Um, I mean, if you don't know BT stuff, definitely go and check it out if you're interested in edits and cutting up stuff. Um, Ema... Was the first one with it? Yeah. Uh, Embracing the Sunshine. Was that the other? Embracing the Sunshine and all those wheel sounds. And then he went yeah, running Still down Life st- and Motion. Yeah, Motion is st- motion and Still motion, Life. Motion is Still Life. It had a couple of... It had... Um, Hip Hop Phenomenon was probably the track with the most cuts ever in a tune ever. I wonder do I have it here? Since we're actually... We just got a PRS license. We're allowed to play tracks now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to use it. God damn it. Uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, dear. I don't think that's the right one. <laughs> nah, it's not the right version, but there is BT or... Nami one. No. You can try it on YouTube. Uh, B- BT is is my musical hero. I think he's just incredible force. Uh, I love him, and I always have from the moment. You love him with your. Well, not that. You love him, or you love his music. I love his music. I love his production <laughs> work, and I may have a soft spot for his his this blonde is, tipped this, hair and his. This. Californian smile. You like his, like his hair brand? I like his hair brand. Yeah. And his like rippled his muscles. Brand. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've got... Uh, I'll, I'll just turn off the stutter edits on this for a second. This is just like a wee dubstep thing that I was messing about with um, to play with stutter edit. <laughs> and then I'll solo the drums and I'll put some stutters on the drums. So I've loaded stutter edit onto the end of the chain. And the, the way it sort of works is you trigger stutters with uh, MIDI. So let me see which one is assigned to drums. Do you have any on drums? working there's a key in the keyboard there Chris and see getting any stutter action mm. any keys mm. no it mustn't be assigned basically the idea is you have to assign it to st- yeah still not working here I'll load a new one in anyway and I'll uh so uh, that was stutter edit uh, <laughs> moving <laughs> on <laughs> 
Oh, I think Ableton has crashed. So, stutter out a solid piece of software. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And, <laughs> yep, there we go. Okay. Uh, uh, somebody said in the forums you have a bromance for PT. <laughs> you knows it, dude. JB wants to know the elephant sound. What? Okay, let's try this again. I'll uh, delete this stutter edit and load a new one on. Okay, where is the elephant sound? Is this the... I don't know. The... 135. So no, right. You work away there trying to break things and I'll... Uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to load another stutter edit on here. Um... And then what we do is create a MIDI track and we assign the MIDI out to our master channel and then to our stutter edit. So when we play keys, it should switch presets. So you can see I'm playing keys on the keyboard here and it's switching presets. So I'll, I'll uh, let the music play and then I'll play some of these keys. <laughs> There's a few examples of the presets. Um, so, sorry, I haven't seen this before. Yeah. So, can I just pick your brains as to what's going on yeah, here? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, 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 I'll show you sort of the. Well, you asked me a question. Okay. Is, you? is it like a channel strip, a, ch a chain, and you're triggering different chains? Is that? Um, no. Sort <laughs> of. You've got sort of two. You've got sort of two or uh, two sort of main elements to this. The You've got your stutter, so it'll it'll chop stuff up into into the sort of different parts, and then you've got what those different parts are playing, and that's your buffer. Mm -hmm. So you imagine if you have a a, a four bar loop, mm -hmm. you can have that cut up into sixteen, mm -hmm. which would be Slices. your stutter length, right? Yep. Hold on, I'll, I'll create a can I create an empty preset reset preset manager. So that's let me go for empty. Okay, so okay, so that's just a basic stutter. That's an eighth stutter, and that's what your mm -hmm. sort of empty preset loads up. So we can turn that up to like sixteen. And at the minute, it's just playing the kick at the start. Mm -hmm. If we turn our buffer position on, ah, right, and play it. So that's like different slices. Yeah, so that's cycling, that cycling through the different slices. Now, ah. what you can do is then sort of arrange your buffer to maybe only play, you know, say the snare or the. Is this a snare? <laughs> Or you could have it cycle between, say, just you can change the grid size of your buffer as well. Uh -huh. So you could go between the snare and the one an eighth after the snare. And then you can. Change it to slider where it's actually sliding along and back across, and forth. Yep, yeah. yep. Or you could have a random. So I'll just hit any. So that gives you the sort of the option to sort of um, tweak where what slices are being stuttered, and you can do the same thing with uh, your stutter length. So you can have it sweeping between, you know, say thirty-two and sixteen. <laughs> You can do that over more as well. You can get up to six, just, you can get up to two, five, six, or whatever. So, and then you can adjust the curve. So, where's it going to start? So the curve sort of just. Um, 
either extends the length of it at one end or the other so you mm -hmm. can have it like stay more on the 16th or stay more at the end and so it, rather than a linear it, it'll be a more exponential curve it'll be an exponential curve yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got palindrome looping do you know what a palindrome is chris abba abba is a palindrome <laughs> brian <laughs> <laughs> brian uh Palindrome, ABBA is a palindrome. It's a word spelled the same backwards as it is forwards. So A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A. So a palindrome loop basically plays forward in one direction and then plays the same thing back the other direction. So Thank God I knew what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that the, the, the wee um, indicator there is going to the end and then coming back. Yeah. Palindrome looping off. <laughs> Just cycle round. So that the, sounds like a BT word to me, rather than writing that's just back that's, and forth I looping. Would say that's just a similar with her transient shaper mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Um. So to to me, like I played a lot with the other other stuff on it, yeah. and the thing that I found most useful was just f f using it to do your stutters, doing it, using it to actually do your cuts. Mm -hmm. Um, so you could have on one key we could have a sixteenth cut, and then on another key we could have an eighth. So you play your. Need to make that active, and then I'll make another one as well and put out on six thirty twos. And uh, again, it was, they were talking about you know is is using stutter edit cheating. I don't think it is. I think it's just a really simple way of sort of getting cuts and stuff. <laughs> If you want to go in and find cut those all up and map them out, please. Yeah, you know. so you, you could go in and do all that, yeah. and then you've you've got some of the stuff. Stereo delay, I couldn't really find a massive use for it. Low pass filters are, and high pass filters are are pretty obvious. Like they're really useful for for stutters. Um. <laughs> And then the bit depth, bit reduction is good as well. Is it bit redu reduction or lo-fi? I think it was bit reduction. Let me try and get it on a nice... Yeah, I'll try the other one. So that's cool. Yeah. Being able to play it in. What is really cool is then when you record in a MIDI part. Yeah. With your stutter. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you when your your overwrite button doesn't work or your overdub? I don't know. Logic doesn't have an overdub. <laughs> yeah, it, it crashes. Hold on, I'll save this and load it up again. If if I crash uh, Ableton yeah. and then reload it, uh, my over overdub overdub doesn't work. And so is Stutter Edit prone to crashing? It's now done it twice, or is no? Well, that wasn't the Stutter Edit crash okay. that time. It was just an Ableton thing. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, no, it hasn't hasn't actually crashed. I before. I would get lost in that for days. That would be my problem. Yeah, I mean it's it is great. I mean, I it's definitely in it, as you said. You know, you can either go in sample by sample with a with a scissor tool and cut it all up. You know, or you can use that. And I think that's where it's really where it really comes into its own is just the the actual stuttering and cutting up ability. And then you can use you know the same techniques as you would have used previously to to manipulate your chains. So you can add your own effects to your different chains, and you can use a different couple of different stutter edits to mm -hmm. to different channels and. You know the same as you would before, but just that initial cutting stuff up is is really handy. It's quite like, quite expensive, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's one hundred and twenty five quid or one hundred and thirty quid. In my world, that's quite expensive. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you think it's worth it? I, I I my favorite bit of producing is the end bit where it's all kind of mixed down, and it's going to your fancy next ten percent, mm. and that is uh, chopping up and adding phasers and stuff. I I love that. So with that kill it for me or yeah i mean i i, I think it's yeah it's, it's it's the it's the one of the only glitch plugins that i have used that is usable yeah okay you know what i mean i think yeah. the other ones are a bit hit and miss you know you, you play with them and 
you can you know you have to record five minutes and then cut two oh, seconds, okay. two bits yeah, out yeah. of them or right? You can actually design your you know design what you want to do, whereas opposed to just sort of you like, can program it you, and it'll do it every time. On, yeah, on the spot whereas the other ones like Glit, DB Blue Glitch and you know the other Glitch plugins, I find that it was you know I think because they have sliders for randomness and stuff like yeah, that yeah. or when things are going to happen, you tend to just sort of have to let it run and pick bits out. With this, you can actually play in the stuff you want to play, in. And, and obviously it, you can be using it for live stuff as well. So there we go. That's t- that's pretty much us for the show, is it? I would say. Where should we try and fit any any more questions? You want to try and squeeze uh, in? No, but th- 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 just all take too long. I just I think we should say thank you for everybody for sending in questions. I hope you found it all useful. We had awesome fun doing it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And we'll definitely be doing another one. Um, everything seemed to work. I don't know. We we could be talking to nobody. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we could be talking to a screen. Uh, thank you for taking time out. Uh, probably with the second screen while watching the football. Uh, do send YouTube links. We will try and yeah, we'll get a we have a post on on our forums, so we'll keep that open. And if you want to just keep stuff flying in, and we'll we'll obviously we've got our get that sound forum, and we've got our how to make forum, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, just keep posting questions in there, and in a couple of weeks we'll do another one and and post a, or do another show and answer all those questions, and hopefully we'll get you all join us. Yeah, and if any of you have got any kind of projects and stuff, I think we want to try and get maybe like a couple guys projects. If you want to sort of collect all and save and get those sent across, and we can we can try and do some live sort of opening up and do a bit of mixing on it. And yeah, that would that would be honest. very interesting to sort of open somebody's Ableton project and yeah. and start hooking. We won't be mean or nasty. <sighs> we'll be uh, very complimentary or send us you know SoundCloud tracks or YouTube links. We can play them to everybody and give our expert and i'm doing inverted commas in the air <laughs> expert opinion can see yeah can they not see this oh no all right fair <laughs> enough <laughs> maybe and hopefully next time you will actually be able to see us as well we're uh, yeah. probably hook up a, a camera next time maybe and uh so we can i i, I suggest that maybe more people will want to see an ableton screen rather than my face <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah well and we'll, we'll we should be able to have we might do um if we get our switcher we're supposed to be getting we uh We'll be able to have iPad stuff, so we might do a, a cu- quick couple of things on some iPad music style apps as well. Okay, well, look, this is the start of something, hopefully, uh, brilliant, and hope you've enjoyed it, and see you next week. Yep, thanks very much. We'll catch you later.